It is. So uh, uh, as we mentioned today, we're having our speaker is uh, Stan Sharp. Uh, Tanya, have you got a few words you'd like to stay, say about this? No, Tanya is saying no to that emphatically. <laughs> so um, we're not sure how this is going to work. We've got a PowerPoint set up there and uh, we know that um, uh, Stan's voice will be loud enough. So um, we're, we're going to give this a try and see how we do with uh, Zoom as well as uh, hybrid for those. Oh, sorry, before we get there, I wanted to bring up uh, John Lawrence. Uh, John, if, if you'll come forward. Um, back a little bit ago, John uh, and Sunrise uh, put a project together and I'm gonna have uh, John give us a, a bit of information on that. Just right in front of there is the best way to do. Thanks, Brent. Um, yes, we uh, had a CK paddle and clean, um, which was part of the uh, rivers cleanup day, 4th September of the year. And for those of you who are not aware, it was started by a Canadian in BC. Um, there are now thousands of people that uh, participate in that. And this year, for the first time, uh, Rotary uh, through uh, SRAG was promoting it. So uh, we uh, um, are working with the Thames Valley Conservation Authority on a project called Imagine McGregor. <clears throat> and uh, as part of that, uh, we sponsored a uh, panel and clean. And I um, uh, want to say a big thank you to uh, Barry and Brett for organizing a uh, clean along the river and uh, I've got uh, some shirts here that those people who are participating. Uh, Karen Kirkwood White, if you'd come up, please. Chandra. Tony. And if there's one left over, we'll make sure it gets to Barry. Thank you very much. Chandra. I'm pretty sure Tony and I will make it look nice too. Yeah. There we go. And myself. Yeah. And, and Barry. Barry here. Barry, you can take this through the camera if you want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, on the back, uh, there's a list of the sponsors. And we're very appreciative of the various uh, groups that helped uh, sponsor it. Um, and Thanks to uh, your work and the work of, there were uh, 22 paddlers uh, that were out on the river. And uh, we collected over a half a ton of uh, materials that should never have been in the river. So I want to say a big thank you. So thanks very much. Thank you, John. So we always try to uh, adapt. And uh, in this case, we adapted because I'm not sure Karen or myself or Chandra, Tony, I know would be good with paddle, but the rest of us, including Barry, I'm not too sure about that. So uh, we cleaned up a, a long um, part of the main street down by the, uh, right across from the retro suites. And we came up with some very interesting things like a toilet seat, uh, a backpack, uh, a pair of blue jeans, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, so you'd just be surprised at what shows up along the side of the river. And of course we had to back it up because two weeks before the river was exceptionally high and I'm afraid it might've swept many of us away with or without a paddle. Um, so at this time, I'm gonna call upon Stan Sharp if uh, you'll come up and we're gonna see how this goes. I, I think um, uh, you can stand at either point, um, but if you need us to move that forward, we can do that. Um, okay. It seems to be from where whatever you're going to put on there. So if your PowerPoint will go on there, I believe that's what will show up here. So 
we're okay. Yeah. Do you want me to sit there and yeah, we're forward? Okay. Allison. Allison would. Yeah. Hey, please. <laughs> the closest. Yeah. So you do need me to stand here or no? Doesn't matter. Your voice is probably coming over microphone here. Okay, so I'll stay close enough to this microphone. Okay. Thank you to the club. Yeah, those, uh, if you ever meet any of my former students, they know I'm not wed to podiums and that I tended to move around a lot when I talk. So, uh, so this will be different for me. Thank you to the club for the invitation again, uh, specifically thanks to Jennifer. I think it shows that Jennifer is an optimistic and hopeful person. She said, if we just give him enough chances, he's bound to do a good one sooner or later. So, uh, so I hope I don't let you down, Jen. So, yeah, so we have Remembrance Day tomorrow. Tomorrow it's also the 100th anniversary of the policy being adopted as a symbol um, for remembrance by more than one country, but Canada, of course. And I just wanted to take you through a few stories of local remembrance here and show you some pictures of uh, local guys, but show you some pictures of local um, history that reflects uh, remembrance. And I even wanted to take you, I'm going to do a little bit of remembrance at the end. It's uh, not standard and Janet's not here and it's too bad because this had to do with the question that Janet gave me a couple years ago. And it's actually some really positive and generally uh, nice remembrance. So uh, so we'll, all keep, we'll keep it pretty local. I'll go as fast as I can. If I'm going over time, let me know because I'll stop because uh, no matter what I do here, it's the condensed version. Those of you who know me know I can just keep going on this for... <laughs> ad nauseum, so I don't want to bore you or, or keep you from other commitments you have. So go ahead, please, Allison. Um, some of you guys know one of the first things I can talk about is CKSS. This is our, our CBS Chatham Vocational School, um, World War II Memorial in the pictures, and there are 44 guys, 44 graduates from that school that were killed in the Second World War uh, alone. And, and uh, uh, that uh, memorial was the result of largely a gentleman, a teacher named Peter Stoyanovic, starting it back in the 80s and that. And I was always in awe of the work he did because he had to do all the research on all the men. And this was before the internet existed. And he would take his vacations and that and go to Ottawa. And he would go see families and go to churches or meet family members all over the province. And he'd write letters. And, and, and it was uh, some real old school hard work where, where he learned the stories in great depth of these 44 men. And that's only from CBS. That's only from one school. And you guys can imagine that uh, Chatham would have been much smaller back in, you know, the 1940s, right? And that 44 graduates from one school were killed in that conflict. And, and I think it's safe to say that those of us, if we'd lived here then, you know, would have known. Them. They would have been friends. They would have been neighbors. They would have been... Uh, uh, you know, in some way connected to probably everybody in town. Um, so uh, it, it's easy when you start to think, and that's only one memorial for one group of guys from one school. And if you multiply that, you can imagine that any of the conflicts we've been in where we've lost Canadian service personnel would have had a tremendous effect on communities, right? Tremendous effect for many years. Uh, go ahead, please, Allison. Some of the guys there, so I can't get all 44 on one slide, but there you go. And what always stands out, I used to ask most people, and you guys can tell from the picture, is young, very young. The oldest guy of the 44 was 35 years old. And he was the you know, so 30 or 31, 35, and the rest were all um, in their 20s, except for a couple. Go ahead, please, Allison. And the couple that weren't in their 30s were in their teens. And we don't have graves for them because of those 44 guys, only two were in the Navy, the rest were Air Force and Army. And the two in the Navy were both lost on service and their bodies were lost at sea. And they were 18 and 19 years old. So the only place you can see a memorial to, other than CKSS to those two young men is this is the Halifax Memorial and it has panels with names on it. And if you go ahead, please, Allison, I can show you. So the two young men from the CBS 44, so Raymond Belanger was 19. <coughs> There's Belanger's name right there on the Halifax Memorial. And go ahead, please, Allison. And Wilfred Carter, Wilfred Carter was 18. And Carter is down here. Uh, go ahead, please, Allison. Um, one of the 44 was killed at Dieppe from CBS. And if you go ahead, please, Allison. 
Um, there are local connections to Dieppe because the Essex Scottish, which is now the Essex Kent Scottish Regiment, landed at Red Beach, right in the center of Dieppe, right in the center of it. Okay, they weren't on the periphery at all. And there are two memorials. One is at Dieppe, and this is the picture of the one at Dieppe. Uh, I've just put it there twice, and that's the uh, Essex Scottish or Essex Kent Scottish uh, emblem. Uh, there is an identical memorial to this in Dieppe Gardens in Windsor. Some of you might have been down there along the riverfront, or if you were ever around Windsor on Remembrance Day, or if you were ever around Windsor on August 19th, which is the anniversary of the Dieppe Raid, you would see the Essex Kent Scottish right there uh, paying tribute. Okay. So a uh, really good morning, you can see the symbol, very simple, it's about the date in the Essex Scottish Regiment. And if you go ahead, please, Allison. Oh, I didn't, oh, I don't know why I didn't put it in. The, the guy who died there uh, was William Taylor, and Taylor was a Scottish, uh, a sergeant in the Essex Kent Scottish. And um, he's got one of those interesting, mysterious stories where uh, his body is found a few days later up the channel closer to Calais. And, and, and the, the English Channel there has quite a tide in it and, and quite a rise and fall in the tide. So if, if his landing craft wasn't blown up, then he was killed somewhere on the beach within the tidal zone, meaning he didn't get very far. And his body was picked up by the tide and moved quite a ways up the coast. So he's actually buried up there at Calais. He's not buried at, at Dieppe at all. Um, so, but an interesting story and one that we'll probably never know the answer to is what happened to him, okay? Uh, that we, we can only speculate. I think I've told you about Flight Sergeant George Hitchcock before because uh, some of the students I took from CKSS, we were the first people from Chatham to ever go to his grave and uh, that's his grave and it's not a military cemetery where they were buried by locals in a small town just outside of uh, Paris, and he, had, he was killed two days after D-Day. Uh, he was an airman, he was in a plane that was shot down by a German night fighter, and the locals buried the crew. They ran into the site and got all the bodies and buried them so that the SS and that wouldn't do anything uh, to the bodies. So he's not in a military cemetery, and that's why uh, uh, the grave um, isn't visited very much, but no one from his family had ever visited the grave until we went there, and that's something I think we forget is that, you know, in our day and age, and Brett knows, and Brett was so helpful with us always taking the kids over to Europe, but many of us until COVID thought, ah, travel, we can do that, we can go, we can jet to Europe, we can jet there, but in their day and age, you know, a trip to Europe was, was something, it was a pretty big deal, and even after the conflicts, it was like the family, even if they had a grave to go to, it wasn't that simple to, to pay respects to somebody in the family and visit the grave. So, uh, you know, really hit the students that we're the first ones from Chatham ever to go to the guy's grave. Uh, go ahead, please, Allison. And in fact, the family members that we invited to our Remembrance Day ceremony came from Barrie in Toronto and they gave us his medals because they said, you guys have done more for uh, his memory than anybody else. Um, I think I pointed out to you before, this is a memorial cross and this is a, a medal that would be issued to the family, the surviving family members, usually the parents of a Canadian soldier killed in conflict. And uh, Hitchcock's Memorial Cross is up here. So that didn't go to him. The only way you get it is to die in action. And his is interesting because um, you probably can't see very well, but it doesn't have the ribbon on it. And what it has is he was the only son. Uh, his mom survived. She had three daughters and one son. Hitchcock was her one son. So she clearly took this to a jeweler's and had that, it had to, it took the ribbon off and had a brooch made so that she could wear that on her coat or on her blouse every day rather than putting a medal on over your head. So she clearly um, went to time and expense to share her loss with anybody that she met in public. Okay, I'll go ahead please. Awesome. Oh, there's Taylor. I got it mixed up. It was just out of order. That's Taylor. He's the sergeant in the Essex Scottish who was killed at Dieppe. He sits a great picture of him in Chatham before he shipped off in the dress uniform of the Essex Scottish. Uh, go ahead, please, Allison. 
Uh, take you back even further, First World War. Some of you guys know that the Kent Regiment or the Kent Battalion was the was one raised right in the community. And through the four year conflict, um, there were various recruiting drives, but this was the first big one. And this is a picture of them actually. And we've got the date and they're in London, Ontario, just before shipping out. So the way they all got out of town was they all signed up and they all went down to the train station. They went up to London, mustered up there and trained. And then they would have shipped out to the East Coast and got on boats and gone over to England and then to France. But uh, so this is midway through the war. There's uh, still big years of battles uh, to come. And, and many of these guys would have seen it. And a few World War One stories, a few simple World War One stories for you will follow. So go ahead, please, Allison. Um, <clears throat> Uh, local historian Jerry Hind has done some fantastic work, particularly on, well, well he, he, he's done uh, fantastic work on, on all um, local um, servicemen and women killed in action. Uh, but he puts it at about 300 or 350 people from the community would have died in the Great War. And our population in Chatham and Kent around then was eight to 9,000 people. So you know, a fraction of our population today, but you know, you can imagine what 300 to 350 killed in action would have had effect on the community. And these are just a few pictures of the guys. And I'll just tell you a few stories and show you a few interesting local um, connections here. So go ahead, please, Allison. Uh, when I would do the uh, presentations at school or when I would teach my classes, I would always just try and, uh, um, show them that you know personal connections and one of the things i did was i would do a bunch in class where well when you look through the death rolls for world war one one of the things because it has their addresses on it is one of the things you automatically realize jeepers chatham was a lot smaller back then because you keep seeing the same street names but you don't see other street names for example prestantia didn't exist in the first world war but old you know king street Queen Street, Victoria, those ones existed, okay? And you can almost, without having a map, draw a road map of Chatham by just looking at the death rolls for the First World War because it's amazing the number that lived on King Street, the number that lived on Queen Street or the streets downtown around the library are just peppered with these. But any newer area, no, they didn't exist. So not only you know, did we lose a lot of guys, but they were in this really condensed space, this much more condensed community than we have today. So the reason I have the street signs up here was I just would try to show my students that you walk down that street, that guy lived on that street, okay? but he didn't come home, right? Uh, Bone's story, was a, he was five foot three, he was a slight guy, only about a hundred pounds. So when he went to enlist, uh, he kept getting rejected for physical reasons. He tried three times and third time was a charm. He got in, but he got in to go over and he was only in service about six months before he was killed in action, but he had to go. So that was also part of my story for my students would see like whatever the reasons were, uh, they were so determined to serve, you know, that, that they wouldn't take no for an answer. Uh, go ahead, please, Elsie. Oh, strange way, yeah, strange way. Um, a strange way story is not unusual, but you see, I have them up there because there again, Taylor Avenue existed at the time of the First World War. Um, so, and that's one that all our students at CK would, Taylor Avenue is right, you know, the street that it's on, McNaughton and Taylor is where CKSS is. So I definitely put them in. But, but Taylor, or uh, strange way's story is not that unusual. He was wounded and returned to action and was killed later. Many of these guys were wounded and their natural impulse was, hey, if it's not a debilitating injury, I want to heal and I want to go back with my buddies, you know, and, and the forces on these guys to go and do that were enormous. Okay, I'll go ahead, please, Allison. Uh, McFarlane, McFarlane, uh, McFarlane's is one of the saddest stories because he was wounded. And again, another one. So Victoria Avenue existed at the time of the First World War. Uh, McFarlane was wounded, one of the saddest stories, and he was evacuated to an aid station. And the aid station is the first medical station you would have closest to the front. So it could be within 100 or 200 meters of the front line. And he was lying on a stretcher at the aid station and he was shot by an enemy sniper and that's what killed him. Uh, next, please. 
Taylor, oh, I just wanted to point out that like all these guys and women were so brave. Oh, that's a military cross. Taylor won the military cross or earned the military cross. The military cross is a gallantry award and it's won down from the highest award, which is the Victoria Cross. So you had guys in Chatham Kent earning the uh, military cross. And, and the only way you can do that is extreme acts of heroism. Okay. Uh, go ahead, please, Al. Uh, one guy from Chatham Kent um, earned the VC, the Victoria Cross. If you ever see a military stone or that actually then the symbol this is the symbol for the you see that matches that and and the one on the right is the victoria cross and there's 71 canadians who get the victoria cross in the um uh first world war and much fewer oddly enough in the longer war the second world war um minor uh he's born in cedar springs we won't go into much else about it that is it was incredibly brave guy he's killed in the act of uh, the act that gets him the award is what gets him killed incredibly brave um he moves out he moves up to elgin or somewhere else later and his victoria cross is at um the museum there now so it's always sort of a little dispute well who, who's whose hero is he well he's really a canadian hero but uh, but he was born in Cedar Springs. So he was from this area. Go ahead, please, Al. Uh, Major Smith. Major Smith was famous. You guys, he gets written up in the Chatham Daily Planet at the time, and uh, just for an act of he spared a German soldier's life, and and it was this great, you know, amidst all this this uh, chaos and evil of battle and all this terrible stuff, is you have this great act of humanity where he spared a young German soldier's life. And that's not what got him killed. He got killed a few days later. But but even the people at the time thought this was such a great thing, and they were so proud of it. Like war, war doesn't have to be about being, being brutal. This guy gets written up for amidst all the brutality. He shows that he's still human. You know. Uh, go ahead, please, Allison. Um, show you a few close to home. This is Private Thomas Gal, and that's Private. Gal's uh, headstone in um, Maple Leaf Cemetery just down the road. You're only a couple of kilometers away from Private Gal's um, headstone. So question is, okay, well, you know, after the war, there are too many dead for the Commonwealth countries to consider uh, exhuming the bodies and shipping them back over. You know, Canada's got about 66,000 dead in the First World War. So it's decided that the, the Canadian government consciously decides we're keeping the bodies there. The cemeteries are going to be there. They'll be buried with their brothers in arms close to the battlefields where they fell. And that was the Canadian government's uniform policy. So if you ever see headstones here and they're from the First World War, then there's got to be a different story to them. You know, they're not usual. They're a little more rare. And Private Gao's uh, headstone is one. And you can't see, but down at the bottom and everything from the cross up would be standard inscriptions that the government and military would put on a headstone, but anything down here would be put on by the family. And Gauss is, I'm sorry, I can't be, yes, died from effects of the war. Or, and, and in his case, when you look it up, it, he was in the Battle of the Somme and it mentions it, which is 1916, the same year that the, the picture was taken of the Kent Regiment there. And unfortunately, it's a reminder of our fortunate times that we're in that we have so much great medical care and they did the best they could back then but 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 the the nature of the wounds and that that these guys suffered was terrible gal was wounded in 1916 at the somme which was a terrible battle went on for months and it was it was just a battle of attrition it was just who was going to kill more guys on the other side it wasn't really even about taking much territory uh, Gao is wounded in the head and he's evacuated back to Canada. So he initially survives, but he dies in 1920. So he suffered with the effects of that. The wound killed him four years later, okay? And he killed him in Chatham. And he's buried right down the road from here, uh, 20 years old, I think. Uh, go ahead, please, Allison. The Heather family, this is a sad one, you know? Um, father and two sons, all leave from Chatham. Uh, sad, father... Uh, Samuel Sr. carries the oldest son out of the trenches, wounded, and the son dies. That was Thomas. Then the father was killed shortly thereafter. And a month after his father died, the youngest son was killed. So, so the poor 
mom lost her husband and both sons in the war, you know, and, and the father went thinking I can protect the sons, but sometimes you get into things that are too big, right? Too big beyond your control. Oh, go ahead, please, Allison. Here's another one just down the road and an interesting one, very interesting one for our times to remind us that, hey, well, you know, maybe COVID wasn't around before, but people had to deal with other things before. Lemuel Davis was a pharmacy student and he went to, I think, the University of Toronto. So he's going to come back and be a pharmacist in Chatham while war comes up. And of course, you need people with medical training. So he goes and he's in the Royal Canadian um, Naval Reserve. So he goes out and he serves at a, well, I looked it up at first thing it says HMCS Staticona. Well, in, initially you think, okay, that's a ship. Well, I can't find that ship. Well, the Navy also names their bases HCMS and Staticona was a collection of shacks on on the pier at in Cape Breton and it's literally a hospital right on the pier they took over old fishing buildings and turned it into a hospital because of course the minute they got the guys off ships they wanted to care for them they didn't want them to travel too far and so Lemuel Davis worked there uh, Davis dies um He's killed then not by battle because he's in Cape Breton and he's on land, you know, there's nothing that's going to threaten him from the enemy in the First World War. He's killed by the Spanish flu. He's working in a hospital, crowded conditions. He's working hard, gets run down, but the soldiers come back. He dies in 1918 in the fall, just as the Spanish flu epidemic is starting. Uh, and he, uh, so he, the reason he's buried just down here is he dies in Canada. They'll bring him home from Cape Breton and bury him here. And he's in Maple Leaf Cemetery just down the road. And probably you guys know, but, but to be clear, Spanish flu is now, like historically, it, it's wrong. That's the name that comes up, but it's got nothing to do with Spain. Um, Spain during the war is a neutral country. Uh, because they're neutral, there's no um, censorship rules in the press. So it's the Spanish press that starts reporting on the flu epidemic in 1918. So most people, when they try to trace it to a source, say, well, the Spanish were talking about it first. It's the Spanish flu. But it, it had nothing to do with Spain. They just were able to talk about it. So the more appropriate name for it today would be the 1918-1919 flu. And uh, at least when I was in class and I had students until I retired in June, I, I could say, I said, hey, guys, last time we had that, you think COVID, you think you guys are ready, you think you guys are the only one that had these problems is, I said, well, we can at least go back in history and take a look at, you know, other Canadians have faced these issues before. But uh, Davis was a young man and uh, uh, a promising guy and would have absolutely been an asset in the community right back in at the end of the First World War to have a trained university trained pharmacist is, you know, we take our pharmacies and our medical professionals maybe for granted today. But back then that would have been very rare to send a send your, your son or neighbor off and gets that training and comes back and he's killed not by the enemy he's killed by an epidemic okay uh, go ahead please Allison uh, you just see some signs around town don't forget I always like to put the old pictures in for the students and the new ones oh you guys have seen the cenotaph downtown but when you see the old picture you realize hey that's been around for a while hey that is relic really from after the first world war it's been there for a long time and it's been there for reason it was put there by people who had suffered through it and experienced it and whose families had and whose neighbors had and our whole community did and that's why that's there and how many times do people drive by or i i was so amazed how many times you know my students i'd ask you hey you born how many of you guys born in child most of hand where's the cenotaph and it all comes what are you talking about what are you talking about it's like you know and so i'd have to explain that to them and, and say you know not that long ago or at that time when that was put up, everybody would have known where the cenotaph was and everybody would have known why it was important. And that's part of the importance of remembrance, right? If we don't remember, then things like this will just be statues and chunks of stone out in the middle of the street that won't mean anything to anybody. Okay, go ahead, please, Allison, a few quick ones. Obviously, we've had recent, you know, Canada just wrapped up its mission in Afghanistan and uh, Canadian forces went to Afghanistan and we had 158 killed in action there. Go ahead, please, Allison. You know, that's the way they always go off, right? You know, look at everybody smiling, happy, proud to be there. Look, they've all got Canadian flags on their 
uniforms, you know, they're serving their country and they don't get to pick, right? You join the military, you don't get to pick where you go, you know? So uh, uh, they're just doing their duty, right? To this day. Go ahead, please, Allison. But 158 of them came home like that, okay? The uh, pictures up there show you sort of the evolution too within the last hundred years, um, because we have three women up there in combat roles, okay? Uh, we have this gentleman up here is from Wallsburg, okay, so close to home. So we did have a local one in Afghanistan too. His daughter went to our high school for a time. So you just see, um, uh, you know, remembrance is not just remembrance of the First World War, of the Second World War, but we have Canadian troops serving around the globe today and they don't get to pick where they go. Okay, Go ahead, please, Allison. A few quick ones. Here's, here's the quick one. Janet asked me, um, I have enough time. Enough time to go. Okay. Um, Jan asked a couple years ago, are, were there uh, memorials to animals? And I knew there were because, especially the First World War, um, which is more pre mechanized than the Second World War, but even the Second World War, animals were used a lot. Was yes, um, there are memorials to animals. And there was one that I thought of later that I would take the students to in London, England. But I thought, well, well let's talk about some Canadian animals, maybe ones you don't know. Because as much as we can uh, remember our troops, and we should, um, there's a couple of interesting animal stories here that relate specifically and only to Canada. So this is Sergeant Gander down there, but he's not a sergeant there. He, that's him with his original family in Newfoundland. And he is a Newfoundland dog, for those of you guys who are dog people. And you guys can see a Newfoundland dog is a big, strong dog. And that was the problem for the family. The dog was rambunctious and played with the kids, but was bigger than the kids. And it scratched the daughter the one day. And they kind of thought, ah, maybe this dog's a little too much to have around. So they looked to adopt the dog out. And go ahead, please, Allison. So the dog got adopted out to the Royal Rifles of Canada. And here you see, and that's where he gets the name Sergeant Gander. He was a civilian in the first picture. And now he's in the military here. And so now he's got a rank. But what you see is he's the unit's mascot. So he's at the head of the unit. He has a dedicated handler. And uh, he goes where the unit goes. Um, go ahead, please, Allison. Unfortunately, the Royal Rifles of Canada were one of the two regiments that were sent in 1941 to Hong Kong. And for those of you who know history, I, I won't go into too much depth, but this was a sort of stain on the Canadian government in the Second World War, where they decided to reinforce Hong Kong before the hostilities in the Pacific broke out. They did it because Hong Kong was a British colony. We were supporting Britain, but they knew militarily should the colony be attacked, there's no way we can reinforce the troops. There's no way we can evacuate the troops. They are very much going to be sacrificial lambs. So this is one of the stories from World War II, but it's not about the troops who were very brave and fought, fought bravely because when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, they did attack and they did attack and, and capture Hong Kong. This is the Royal uh, Rifles of Canada with Gander again. You see where they put him. He's pretty important to the unit. Uh, he would have been very much, uh, 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 you know, very pampered, very pampered, well taken care of. Uh, so that's them on their way to Hong Kong in October 1941, and the hostilities break out in December 1941. Uh, go ahead, please, Allison. Long story short, when the Japanese attack and the Canadians cannot evacuate or British, no, no, none of the Allied troops are getting out of, I mean, it's going to be 100% loss. It's, they're either killed or captured, okay? Uh, Gander died protecting. Uh, uh, he was in a foxhole with seven members of the unit when a uh, Japanese soldier threw a grenade into the trench. <laughs> and uh, he picked it up. Anyway. The uh, excuse I'm a dog guy. <laughs> the statue is in uh, Gander, Newfoundland. So if you get out there, you can visit it. He's given a uh, award. Uh, I didn't know I collect medals. I never heard of this one. It's called the, the Dickin Medal, and the Dickin Medal is awarded to animals for gallantry. And uh, he's awarded that in 2000. Go ahead. 
on a, a good story, and not a really good story. You guys all know, we all probably grew up with uh, Winnie the Pooh. We know Winnie the Pooh. Well, Winnie the Pooh is a real animal. Was a, not just a cartoon character, but a real animal uh, from Canada, from Ontario. Okay, And it's a First World War story. We don't end up with the Winnie the Pooh story without the First World War. And the story was simply this. Harry Colburn, who signs up with the uh, Winnipeg Grenadiers, I think, and he's a veterinarian. They're shipping out from Winnipeg on a train. They're going, they got to get out to the East Coast. It's going to take them forever, but they got to stop all the way along the way. Stops in, the, oh, what's it called? White River. White River, Ontario, on the North Shore of Superior. He just hops off one day, it's just a rest stop. They're gonna change out the rail crew or whatever, and the train's gonna keep going. And he sees this guy walking around with this bear, bear cub, little bear. And you guys can see, there he is there, very young, okay? Um, he says to the guy, what's going on? And the guy was a trapper. He says, oh, we trapped the mama that we found. So the baby was an orphan, we feel really bad. And he says, I'll take it. You know, so literally, which is kind of gutsy, right? So you're going off the way. Yeah, I'll take the bear with me. Let's go, right? And so he takes Winnie. So there's Colburn pictured with Winnie. And Winnie goes out with the unit and gets on a boat on the East Coast. And he goes out. And you see, he's going to be a very tame bear because um, he's around the soldiers all the time. And they take really good care of them. He becomes the unit mascot. Okay. I'll uh, go ahead, please, Alton. Oh, sorry. Uh, you can go back if you want. If you can't, that's oh, long story short, you guys probably know the story, and it's a good one. I can end with a good one. Um, where uh, they get to England, they train in England the Canadian troops on the Salisbury Plain in, in the winter of 1914, 1915. It's a terrible winter. They actually have their first deaths there from illness just because the conditions are so bad. But once they realize they're going to get shipped off to the battlefield, Colburn. And the unit do not want to put Winnie, or they don't call him Winnie, at the, or, well, they did. Winnie, the name comes, it's short for Winnipeg, okay, where, where they're from. So they decide, well, let's set something up. Like, we don't want to take the bear into harm's way. So they contact the London Zoo, which had just happened to have built a new, uh, bigger, ultra-modern at their time, bear enclosure. And they said, do you guys want this Canadian black bear from Ontario? And they said, yeah, perfect. Like, we've got the exact spot. Like, this is going to work out. So they send uh, Winnie to um, the zoo in London. And Winnie becomes the star of the show. Predominantly because they can let people in the enclosure. The bear's tame. He's like, he's like your pet at home. And why? Because they got him so young. And the soldiers, you know, were so hands-on with them that he was more like a pet dog than a black bear. And so it's very famous. You can look up all these articles and that. And even when Winnie dies, I think it's 1930, he lives a full life. We'll end on a good note. He lives a full life. He's not killed in kind. He's, he's, he's the star of the show at the London Zoo. Is they, they even publish his obituary. It's a big thing in London, England when this bear dies. Okay. Uh, and you can see this is a statue, like we had the statue of Gander out in Gander. Well, there, there's a statue, I think, in Winnipeg, and there's one in South River, or, yeah, so I think it's called South River in, or no, sorry, White River in Northern Ontario, where, uh, where Winnie is commemorated. So, so, sorry, long story short, there on Gander and, and Winnie, uh, that when Jana asked about animals, well, I thought, well, I didn't think I answered a question really well before, and I said, well, there are a couple of Canadian animals that we should think about on Remembrance Day. So uh, there you go. That's all I have to say. Thank you guys very much. Excellent presentation. And, and thank you so much for uh, ending on a happy note there because uh, I think we all need a little bit of that uh, at this point. Um, so uh, were there any questions for Stan? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. We'd uh, love to have more time of, of that. Thank you again, Stan. Really appreciate it. And uh, um, this is the kind of history that uh, is touching right at home. So uh, very interesting to, uh, to hear that.
Um, so next week, uh, things got changed up a little bit. Uh, we're going to have Bala Murtry from District 6380. Bala is the district governor elect. So he will be coming in after uh, President or uh, District Governor um, Brenda Tipton. Um, just a couple of other notes. Uh, we've approved uh, with Pizza for Polio. Uh, through our vendors, we raised $2,700, and the board is upping that to $3,500 that will go into uh, Rotary International. Uh, special thanks again to Tony Hill and Allison Story uh, for um, getting all our vendors in place and the collection and, um, and all of that. So we have some receipts done up. We'll uh, be getting those out to them shortly. Um, also, we have not heard uh, just where we ended up with uh, pints for polio, but we'll get a little bit more detail as soon as uh, Tilbury has it, and we'll let you know. Um, as mentioned before, the uh, Tikal Patan Rachel project is well underway. Um, I was happy to get a note from Peter. Uh, Jennifer and I were up at the bank, did a wire transfer, and you know, here's uh, nineteen thousand dollars is off in limbo, but. Uh, Peter got a hold of me and said, the money's in Guatemala. So I was very happy to hear that. Um, so that uh, pretty much takes care of everything. Uh, again, this is uh, still our foundation month. So if you needed to do anything through RI and you need a little bit of a hand, uh, let me know and I can help you out with that. And is there anything else for the Good of Rotary today? Nope, we're all set then. Let me end our recording.